and uh... so I get the, the fun part of talking about advanced features that we have in EdMaps and how we utilize a lot of this data. As Chuck made it uh, abundantly clear, we work with a lot of different partners. And it's actually that working with our partners that has made the program a success. We don't build a tool in a vacuum. We reach out, find out what they're doing and how this all has to come together for the common purpose. And that is we're heading towards some sort of management. Chuck was saying earlier, it's, it's all about eradication. I deal on the ag side and I deal with endemic pests from time to time. We're not going to eradicate these things. They're here, they're management goals now. And we just need to make sure everyone's on the same page for what management really should be taking place if we're gonna stay ahead of these things and prevent losses. Everything we do is a balancing act. We have certain information that is needed in order to manage it. We're trying to utilize these different audiences out there willing to contribute data. And where they come together, we start looking at, well, are we getting the data we need to actually have the information we need to, to manage it? And did we have the technology to support it? And this is a nice static diagram kind of highlighting that, but it really is an evolving process of when Chuck started talking about the stuff in 2004, well, the technology wasn't there to do some of the really cool stuff we're doing now. So we keep coming back to this question of how do we get the right information to the right people at the right time in a way they're gonna understand it. And it's across all the things we do for the outreach from our programs. I'm gonna start with data visualization here. And what we're trying to avoid is what you're seeing on the right. I know you should never lead with a bad example, but we're not looking to have our visualizations be a Rorschach test. People shouldn't be staring at it going, well, yes, it's very interesting, but I have no idea what you want me to do. We need to tell them exactly, all right, here is what we would recommend for you to be following up with now. And it's, again, that balancing act, looking at what data is coming in, what partners you have out there, and what they're willing to do to provide data that then can be put into something to help inform management in the field. The fun part about it is down the road, we can later tell different stories with the same data. And so what I've got for you are some examples of where we've been working with folks to show this. The questions I've been seeing in the Q&A section are wonderful. And some of them are focusing around, well, do you have maps that show incidents and severity? And well, it depends on what you're looking for. So kicking this off, we're going to go into one that people frequently have. I have a new invasive, in this case, kudzu bug, came in Northeast Georgia. And they wanted this map to say, all right, how fast is kudzu bug spreading? And so you see from that initial infestation in 2009, where they had a reproducing population, and then year after year, they're getting more and more reports further out. What's curious about this is you see that somewhere around 2016, 2017, things started to slow down. You're not seeing numbers in 2020. What's happening behind the scenes or out in the field is you had a pathogen and a number of parasitoids come in that are knocking the population of this new invasive down to the point that when we look at the same data in a different way, this is looking at that data set and saying, how many years has it been since someone was concerned enough to actually report having seen kudzu bug? And we're seeing some places where it's been 10 years since someone's made a report. So have those biocontrol agents been effective enough to actually knock the population back to where we're not having an issue? Or is there less reporting coming in? This is where the working group or the partners we engage are using this to explore those questions and help make everyone aware of what they're trying to do with these efforts. We also have work with a corn disease working group. This is a group out of the, they're actually national, and every year they start reporting where they're seeing southern corn rust and a number of other pathogens. So the gist they're going for with this map is that when this starts out early in the season, you're going to have stuff in South Texas where it managed to last through the winter, and then it starts blowing up as you not only have the host, but the pathogen starts moving up throughout the country. 
So they put this map out there to let people know, yes, we're looking for it. And here's where we're seeing it active this season. Again, another group we work with, the Ambrosia Beetle Working Group, funded out of the Southern IPM Center. They have trapping sites. They extend beyond the Southern region to work with a number of partners. And when you're looking at these counties, there are actually multiple sites within that county. But they don't want to single out a particular producer's farm. So in conversations with them, they said, all right, look at all the sites in that county. Take the worst case. Use that to give me that color on that map. And then when I click on that map, use that site to actually show me a graph of what the population's been doing. This has been the second year they've started collecting data for this, and it's getting interesting because they're actually getting to discussion of thresholds and where that would affect management. It's not quite there yet, but these are the first steps they're making towards some tools that can help inform management in both pecan and nursery production. Some similar pictures we're seeing here coming out of Kentucky, we're looking at corn earworm. Uh, again, another pest on corn, this time an insect. This is giving, it's kind of messy, looking at where the populations have been in different years. As I said, a little messy, but where this really comes in is someone is going to a particular year, mousing over it and saying, okay, that was what the populations did at this site in 2012. And you've got that average line. So where you see it popping above the average line early in the season, you might want to start keeping an eye out because the populations are higher than we normally see. Contrast that with something they see in 2015 that where they started tracking, they weren't seeing populations. And so that maintained throughout the season, but everyone could kind of see, all right, this is what I'm seeing right now. Is this unusual? Should I be concerned? So all those examples were just basic visualization of the existing data people were submitting. The only way they work is if they have enough cooperators willing to, to submit the extra data. In the case of the corn earworm, they had to report counts from traps. For the kudzu bug uh, maps, that was just presence absence, although there may have been other data in the background. What I'm gonna go into now is where we're looking at People taking the data that's available, either through a download, through accessing our API, however we're getting data to them, and producing additional products that add value to that raw data and inform the management decisions. We're going to start with this first one for brown marmorated stink bug. David Crowder's lab out of Washington State University has developed a habitat suitability map for brown marmorated stink bug. And they've done that with the SCRI project that's funded on brown marmorated stink bug and they're collecting more research data within that project. They've been kind enough to let us use that layer and put it up on our maps. And what we're showing now is the overlay of the EdMaps data, where we have sightings of brown marmorated stink bug and that habitat suitability map. And we're pushing this out, telling people, here's what the habitat suitability map currently says. We're looking for more data. We're looking to truth out this habitat suitability model and give them data to refine it. So we're using it in a campaign where you have these red records, that's new records since the campaign started, and then gray, where we had existing data prior to that. It not only reiterates that the populations are still active in those areas, but where we are seeing new reports and, and broadening out what we have. We've taken some steps down the road of looking at climate change models. This is work by Jenica Allen and Bethany Bradley, looking at what environmental factors would, be, would have the preferred environments for different invasive species. This one's Canada thistle. And so they ran a number of 13 different models, seeing whether or not for these different locations, it would be a preferable environment for Canada thistle to exist. This is a great start looking at where these things might be. And, we took their data, ran it through our mapping engine. This doesn't have any particular EdMaps data on it right now, although it was used when they were running their models. We followed this up with, all right, if we overlay that map and allow someone to say how many models they want to look at, we're looking at a comparison of what data is currently in EdMaps and that range model. 
So in some of these cases where you're seeing that orange, we expect that we'd probably see some records for Canada thistle there, but for one reason or another, we don't. It could be a shortage of data. It could be a reality. I doubt the reality in many of these cases, but it's something that we put out there to help encourage data to come in and help to continue some of these efforts. What is fascinating about this is those areas in the darker purple, where as climate changes, perhaps an environment becomes not as preferable for certain species. And when you start looking at how many models agree, in this case, going to 13 models have to agree for it to keep that lavender color, you see that it's not the case. It opens up discussions and it opens up the conversations and, and additional work that would be done, need to be done in the future to help validate this and take better measurements to know what's going on. One of my favorite groups to work with is the pecan group, not only because I like pecans, but they are a very open group for sharing information and data. This is an example of pecan nut case bearer map they have where they have individuals monitoring a trap. And when they get two consecutive catches of adults in that trap for pecan nut case bearer, they can use degree days to project forward when they would have 25 to 50% over position, egg laying in the field. That's the scouting window. That's when scouts need to be out there and active and they need to make their decision about what their management's gonna be for the year. Because after that point, they've kind of settled into where they're gonna be and that was your management window. So they're willing to share, and this is actually down to, to point locations and show this so that other pecan growers in the area can say, all right, well, that site's near me. I can see that I probably should be out looking right now just because our climate's similar to theirs. This expanded out then because we don't have all the coverage we'd love to have into a tool that I can drop a point if I've been doing my own monitoring. I can select my date. Here's my decision windows. So it takes it from doing a abstract kind of on a map, could be my location, could not, to know this is where I have something. Another group we've been working with on the sugarcane aphid side, this has been where they've been trying to develop a model for knowing when you would see an infestation of sugarcane aphid. As the winter comes through, it drives the populations back down to South Texas and New Mexico. And so the population then builds and spreads as the season progresses. So they're starting to get this model refined to the point of where you're seeing on the left, that presence map, saying you're finding it in different counties, they're using that as inputs to start projecting forward where they would expect to see it based on weather pattern and other things. This is great for us because we send them data through, through either downloads or API, and then they're actually taking and building up that model and uploading the model files to us, and we're doing the visualization on our side. So a good collaboration between those two. With this one, this is Cucurbit Downy Mildew, another group we work with pretty, pretty actively. And I said a lot of this was, was models and value added things that were being put in. This particular map is just how many days has it been since somebody reported seeing Cucurbit Downy Mildew on a particular host. It's a good start to saying, yes, I have seen symptoms this year. And I'm still seeing symptoms this year on different hosts. They wanted to take this a step further and they've been doing this for a while. It started back um, in maybe for 15 years. So that's, I'll do math later. They want to do forecasts. So based on the data that was coming in, Thomas Kiever takes and downloads that, looks at it, runs it through the high split model, looks at the weather for the given areas, and he by hand draws these areas of risk on a map. He provides an overview that you can see there on the right. And then for each day of the forecast, he provides very specific recommendation or risk error notes for each day. This then comes out in what he pushes for his forecast. And we send this out to all the folks that are, are subscribed to it. And they're looking at, here's again, that overview, day one, here's what you should expect, day two, Here's what you should expect. 
very straightforward. And from them talking with the pickle packers and all the other groups in that industry, finding out what they need to see to really understand where this goes. And it goes beyond just looking at the raw data coming in. So this takes us into a world of all the stuff we talked about up to this point. There are different visualizations that do exist. We've spent a lot of time working with our partners to understand what exactly they need to see and what they need to show to an audience. Our next trick is actually delivering it there. Um, EdMaps is a wonderful website. However, it's not appropriate for all audiences. There are existing audiences at other places that they need to be able to see this content. And if you tried to make EdMaps one site for every possible commodity and area and everything else, it would get really confusing. So we've spent a lot of time working with our partners, and this is Cucurbit Downey Mildew again, started in 2007. Thank you, slide notes. And for 15 years, they've had this site and been building an audience around, here's the information you need to have. First of all, here's your epidemic status map, and that's embedded onto their site from what our servers. And then here is your reporting form, which looks a heck of a lot different than any reporting form that Rebecca was showing, because it's tailored to their particular project and their particular audience for what they expect to get recorded in and what outputs they're gonna have from it. On the right, you can see the forecast that they have there. And then they've got the section of alerts. And you saw, I think some of the alerts that were in the other system that if you wanna be notified about things happening in a certain area, you can provide your contact information and then you can provide what area do you wanna be alerted about? You could be alerted for everything in the US but you could also drop a point on the map and say, if it's within 50 miles of here, let me know. And let me know either about only the new reports or the new reports once a year. And do I want to get an email or do I want to get text message? So options to control how you want the system to automatically notify you. It sure beats having to always come back and check the map. And, you know, is it, is it here yet? We're beyond that. We can send things directly to people. With that, we also then apply branding. Again, EdMaps is wonderful, but if you throw EdMaps on top of this or AgPest Monitor, they've spent 15 years building this audience. It needs to carry their branding. It needs to have the links to the resources that people would expect to see. And so we've been working with our partners to improve how we incorporate their brand into any messaging, websites, maps, anything else that goes out. The corn disease working groups, another good example of that. If it wasn't for extension specialists and agents in all of these states, this map wouldn't exist. And the clearinghouse site they have is nice, but it's not exactly customized to a particular audience. Produce field crap pathology page is. And this is where we need to embed the map, make sure we're centered on Indiana, get the materials they need there. And even if you download the map, I need to make sure it's the Purdue logo in the corner. So they're maintaining their brand and identity. EdMaps and AgPest Monitor are a tool in the background providing the functionality. And we're happy to play that role. We don't have to be the thing up front in everyone's face. We really need to recognize the partners and programs that make this possible. The best example I can think of this is what we've done with sugarcane aphid, that My Fields, which is a uh, very nice program for scouting pests out of Kansas State. They contribute data through our API. And out of that, we also give them maps so they can see what's currently going on. So they've got these incorporated into their website. The sorghum checkoff wanted to have the maps on their websites. So they added them there. When you look at what EdMaps has, EdMaps, the pictures look different because we're showing overall, because that's what our audience on that site needs to see. And in other places, we do have the spread over time maps to show how it's developed over time and how it's been a problem. What's been interesting is when Georgia had this a, a project where they were reporting how bad are the infestations, we were able to produce these maps that were specific to Georgia because they were the only ones submitting that form of data. 
So they got this and it started a discussion with all the other groups of, all right, well, do we want to all adopt that form of reporting so we can have a uniform map for this? Is there value in this? And that discussion goes on every year to help refine what's going on. That leads me actually to my uh, next part. We all love to assume everything will go to plan. We, we thought of every eventuality. Uh-huh. End of season evaluation is the thing that has to happen because whether, you know, we're not always the team trying to land a rover on Mars. Sometimes we end up in that group in the right. And, you know, COVID happens, some other unforeseen circumstances, and it just does not go to plan. And so there's plenty of gray area in the middle between these two, but it's necessary to get some, some evaluation, know if things are going well. A good example of this we had was in 2019 with tar spot of corn. It's a new and emerging pathogen. And there was a discussion among the corn disease working group. We're showing red on this map. Are we scaring people? Because when you look at this map, if you actually go in those fields, the incidence and severity was fairly low. Yes, it was there, but not at levels that was really going to be causing a problem. So by showing this in this alarming color, do we have an issue here? From that conversation, we led to revising the map. So this is their new one. They've gone to a more of a warning color of, yes, it's positive, be aware. And they've also added found in previous years, providing context to the map to say, You've seen it before. You're likely going to see it again because it, it hangs out on crop debris. So it's okay. It's here. Just be aware of it and look for it in your fields. We've also, again, tar spot of corn and the corn disease working group. When we started building that new map, this was one of the early versions. And there was some concern of going, oh my gosh, look at Iowa. Did it really blow up in Iowa? Is that a, a reality? That's Darren Mueller. He went to all those counties. He found trace levels of the pathogen in the fields. So while we had all the best intentions with this visualization as we were playing with it, had we released this in 2019, it would have possibly given the wrong message. And so we've learned some lessons from that before we actually released it. And we've done some things to make sure that we can give a, a more consistent message to what's going on. I spent a lot of time on visualizations and that's where we've done a lot of our utilization. But going back to that Venn diagram at the front where you have what you need to know, what people are willing to collect and what technology can do, we also focus some of our advanced features on tools that improve data entry. If you can make it so people are willing to give you more information with the same or less effort, generally it's a win on all sides. So we've been looking at how we can help coordinate monitoring programs, helping a coordinator to have a dashboard showing where it is now, where are our known hosts that we could monitor for. And if I do have volunteers, how do I manage who's supposed to go where and look at what and keep all that together? For a participant, it's a little simpler. We need to tell them, I need you to go here and I need you to record this data. So a tool you're going to be seeing released this season is in partnership with the Morton Arboretum that we put up this map that, that you can select a species you wish to show. In this case, I'm showing Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven is a host for spotted lanternfly. The Morton Arboretum and others around Chicago are pretty sure that at some point in their lifetime, they're probably going to see spotted lanternfly show up, and they'd like to be prepared for it. So we're building this tool so that someone can come in and they're making, they're drawing out on here where these monitoring zones they want to be looking for would be. And after drawing that zone, they can give it a name, assign users to it and say what species they want someone to look for. So after I have my monitoring zones on the map, I've got my users assigned to them. Now I have these areas that I can use and say, I want people to monitor in these places. There should be tree of heaven at all these locations based on previous data we've seen in EdMaps. So how can we go ahead and, and send them out for that? This is leading to an expansion to EdMaps Pro. 
that you'll open up the app and see monitoring zones. You'll only see the ones that you've been assigned to. You download them, and then on your map, you see, oh, here are locations I'm supposed to go. Tap one, and you can either get the Google Map directions, or you can open up a reporting form if you've already gotten to the location. The reporting form is straight and simple. First one is a question you wouldn't necessarily expect, but it's really useful to kind of pay back the people who contributed data of Tree of Heaven. Is Tree of Heaven still there? Can we get you to quickly just give us a revisit and say yes or no, I'm still seeing this here. And then the second question it asks, do you see spotted lanternfly? And if so, how many are you seeing? Quick and dirty. It's just directing them to exactly what they need to do. No complicated forms, only the minimum. If they were to say yes to having seen spotted lanternfly, there would obviously be a whole lot more follow-up. But for just coordinating volunteers and getting them out there, it's a good survey tool that should help coordinate those activities. The next part I'll go to, and I've seen several people asking in the, the Q&A, do you guys have an API? We encourage partners to work with us. We know that we are not going to build every single tool that could possibly be built. That's kind of ridiculous to think that we would. We need to engage other folks and make sure they have access to the data that's been released and with permission, access to data that they're allowed to see. So for doing this, we do have an API. Documentation is available at developers.bugwithcloud.org. Currently it contains EdMaps and the resource database, which is a collection of fact sheets, websites, other resources for outreach that we maintain. It's part of the bigger Bugwood umbrella of what we have. The documentation we have for the API is done in Swagger. For those not familiar with it, it's a way of hosting API documentation that's not a pain in the rear. The documentation provides explanations and definitions for what the different fields are. We're always working to improve that and make it clearer. And my favorite feature is this option here to try it out. If I click that option, I then get the option to fill out these different fields, hit submit, and actually see the results coming back from our API. So if you're a new developer or you're just unfamiliar with our API and you want to see the actual results, this is pretty straightforward for getting in, poking it, prodding it, and understanding what you're going to get. The API is going to continue to grow and evolve. Chuck mentioned our image system. We have a presentation system. We're indexing our maps so that all the different ones that are available, people know about them. And we have a system for databasing videos. All that is going to be eventually be included in this for you to access it and use it in your outreach programs. We're all about enabling outreach through common resources. When you're using the API through the developer site, you're using our sandbox server. Sandbox is just like what it sounds. You're meant to go in there and play. It's a development copy of the database that does not have up-to-date information. And it's something that you can submit, delete, do whatever you want to records. It will not affect anything in the real world, meaning production. Our production database is separate, has separate endpoints, separate URLs. So you can try things out, build your applications, get them working like you expect, and then actually get moved to using that on and, and talking to the live data in the system. Feedback is always welcome and encouraged, as I think you might have caught on throughout all those different uh, visualizations. It's a discussion with us. It's, I'm looking to do this. How do we make that happen? I would love to say there was a one size fit all solution for everything, but I think you're, if you haven't seen it already, you're gonna see it, it's not. There's a lot of different environments, a lot of players involved, and it's just finding solutions that work for everybody involved. So with that, that's most of the advanced features that we have.